One word. Super Mario Sunshine! Woohoo! Released in 2002 for the Cube, Mario Sunshine is a spiritual successor to Super Mario 64, one of the most beloved platformers of all time. So needless to say, it had a lot to live up to and ho 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 boy did it live up to them. Directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi and produced by series creator Shigeru Miyamoto, Super Mario Sunshine takes Mario and friends on a relaxing vacation on the beautiful isle of Isle Delfino. The minute Mario lands however, he's immediately arrested and sentenced to 30 years community service. This game is incredibly fun. Its bouncy, colorful atmosphere and slick, precise movement make it a sequel that Mario 64 is proud to have. This game, despite the name, isn't all sunshine and fun times, however, because if you're looking, you can begin to find cracks. These cracks point to a much darker truth hidden below. I've been noticing a few of these cracks and weird oddities in sunshine for a while now, and today, I've decided to finally take a deep dive into sunshine's very own iceberg image. Neighboring islands. In the intro movie to Sunshine, you may have noticed something on the world map. There are other islands around Isle Delfino that we never visit in game. But what are these islands and who lives there? Well, we got jellyfish, turtle, and even triangle, so who knows what might be out there? Since we don't see them in game, you might think it might be hard to figure out what's on these islands, but other games feature places that could be linked to Isle Delfino. YouTuber Skellix made a great video on this, and I highly recommend checking it out, but some highlights. Double Dash holds a lot of clues, like, for example, Peach Beach. Just take a look at the track from above, give it a little this, and then bing bang, boom! We got a crack claw. Hints like these could mean that all the islands are inhabited and connected, in one way or another, to the Mushroom Kingdom itself. Like, maybe one of these islands is actually the bonus painting in Super Mario 64 DS, or maybe one of these has a golf course from Mario Golf or a tennis court from Mario Tennis. Maybe one of these islands was transformed into a Mario Party board. Either way, it's interesting to imagine what's out there, and if Nintendo ever wants to make a Sunshine 2 in some alternate reality timeline, I think it might have been cool to see these islands in action. 120 Shines If you manage to get all 120 shines and beat the game, you unlock a new version of the ending. And you'd probably imagine that, you know, since the player put all this time and effort into getting every single shine, even every stupidly difficult bonus level, collecting every single blue coin, they would deserve a big reward, right? Welp! The only thing we get in this different ending is a picture, a still image at the end of the credits, which shows Mario with all the characters in the game, rather than the usual ending shot, which is just Pianta on a beach with a paintbrush. I find this so disappointing since there's other cool things you get in the game for collecting 30 shines or just beating the game regularly that for something so difficult, 100% in the game, all you get is a different ending screenshot and a little star above your name. What are these rewards, you may ask? Well, that leads me into my next entry. Sunglasses. If you collect 30 shines in Super Mario Sunshine, you can go down to the beach and talk to this Pianta, who will reward you with sunglasses. After you beat Bowser, you can talk to him again for another reward, this time a t-shirt. Both these rewards are so cool and, like, unique. When you think of most games, rewards for collecting certain milestones are one-ups or access to new parts of levels, but something this out of the way and sort of unique I think is really cool and fits with Sunshine's image. Also, these sunglasses and t-shirt can only be worn in Delfino Plaza, which I feel is kind of weird. Like, why not let the player wear them throughout the levels? Maybe it'll break cutscenes, but... Who cares? <laughs> Who cares if Mario doesn't have sunglasses and cutscene? Having this and then comparing it to what we got for the 100% completion reward, you can begin to understand why I'm disappointed. Like, they could have done so much cool stuff with it, but they just, they didn't quite get there. El Pientissimo. This is a funky little character in Sunshine who appears as a man dressed like a pianta. Now, usually in game, he never removes his suit, and so 
we never really know who he is. But see, we can control the game itself and take off his mask manually for feeling he is... The... The Running Man? Last time we saw him was in Majora's Mask. My man ran so fast he ended up in Mario! Seeing other areas in the distance. I always found this so cool, so since Sunshine takes place entirely on one island, Nintendo decided to show off a little and make it so you can see other areas in the distance. For example, you can see Rico Harbor from Delfino Plaza, and as a kid, I always thought this was so cool, I wonder if I could ever make it over there. Well, you kinda can. One example is using a glitch in Bianco Hills to surf a lily pad out of bounds. Then you can just sail over to Rico Harbor and fall to your death. Yeah, these areas weren't real. They have no collision and are barely rendered, but from a distance, it looks real. Space World 2001 trailer. At Space World 2001, Nintendo showed off a trailer for Super Mario Sunshine, and this version is much different than what the final game ended up looking like. The buildings are relatively the same, but the hub as a whole is quite different. It's much more open and circular, along with the fact that there's enemies just roaming freely. We do see Piantas who look basically the same, but we also see a human villager briefly. She looks similar to Malin from Ocarina of Time, so maybe she was just some sort of placeholder? But then that would suggest that Isle Delfino was planned to have human residents at one stage. Overall, this version of Sunshine seems like it would have been a much different game than the one we ended up getting, and some of the ideas and assets used in this build of the game are still in the game's files, and we'll talk more about them later. One thing I will say, however, is the goddamn music! Mmm, it is bopping on this stage! Tramplin Stew The Tramplin Stew is a beta enemy who has a bulb-like head with two eyes and long legs, along with a functioning anus. This large creature appeared in the Space World Trader, but only barely made it to the final game. Examining it now, it seems not too unfinished. It has AI and seemingly has all of its animations. You can even spray it with water and it will react. Not much is known about the Trampling Stew besides what we saw in the Space World trailer. It seemed that the Trampling Stew was going to walk around and be a mostly passive enemy. I would have liked to see something like this in the final release, but I can understand how annoying it would be if when you came back from a level you had to keep killing this enemy over and over and over again. However, the creepiest part about all of this has to be the eyeball that's hidden inside the bulb on top of its head. This is most likely going to be a weak spot, but why an eye? Why not just a patch of goop or a bulge? I find this really odd and sort of ominous, but I don't know man, this is on the second layer. Let's not, go, let's not get too deep just yet. Going through the ferris wheel. In episode 5 of Pina Park, Mario was tasked with fixing the ferris wheel, that is now spinning out of control, due to an electrified turtle sitting near it. And not only that, but the game expects you to climb up that. But what if Mario just said... Well then, you can just hop straight through the spinning death wheel and land unharmed. Then it's just a quick jump to the finish. I feel like this glitch isn't as well known as some others on the list, but I still think it's cool nonetheless. And it saves so much time. I mean, f the cage mage, dude. Sunshine's movement was not built for precise platforming indoors, and yet here you are inside this giant cage, and Nintendo expects you to just hop right up. There is a lot of turtles everywhere. How the? F Serena Beach is a GameCube controller. Serena Beach is the sixth area in Sunshine, and its main attraction is Hotel Delfino a creepy, haunted hotel that Mario slowly fixes up throughout his missions. It's cool to see the hotel slowly become more and more usable as time goes on, but that's not what we're talking about. Most of these missions take place inside the hotel, but this is not where Mario starts. Mario starts just outside this hotel in a nice front area, looking over the sea. Now, you all know this, alright? You're not stupid. But what you might not know is that if you take a zoom out of the whole area, it's actually shaped like a GameCube controller. And looking at it from above, this seems so obvious. Like, why did we not question the fact that there was four pools all gathered around each other, all weirdly shaped? Like, no one thought that was that was kind of weird for like a second? Kug. The Kug is a Goomba-like creature that was originally planned to be in Sunshine. It seems to be some sort of weird love child between a Goomba, Galoomba, and a 24-pack of Fun FX Twistables. We know very little about the Kug, and judging by its appearance, he was probably a doodle by one of the devs, which was eventually transformed into the strolling stew. Despite this, you can still find him in-game. 
Eh, kinda. By using cheats, you can take the camera out of bounds and find him hanging out under the Ferris wheel in Peanut Park. But why is he hanging out down here? Who knows, maybe one of the devs was just using him for testing and then forgot to loot this little guy. Book in the Bottle In the Red Coin mission of Noki Bay, you can find a rock formation at the bottom of the bottle. Well, rock formation is a bit generous, it's more like a couple of blue rectangles. In between these rocks there's a locked door, and hidden inside that door is a secret book. This book is a cut item that was likely going to be used for a shine mission, like having to retrieve it for the Nookie Elder, but was scrapped before the game's release. The door was probably put there to cover it up, or was once opened to get the book, but was locked when the mission was cut. We know very little about this book, but we have many theories. In the early days of the internet, a playground rumor floated about that you could access the book in the Japanese version of the game, but this was easily disproved. Another theory suggests that the book directly relates to a quote by Miyamoto. The quote goes, What if everything that you see is more than what you see? The space that appears empty is a door to another world. What if something appears that shouldn't? You either dismiss it or accept that there is more to the world than you can think. Perhaps it really is a doorway. And if you choose to go inside, you'll find many unexpected things. In this situation, the thing to appear through the otherworldly door would be the secret book, and pursuing it would lead to further secrets. Miyamoto's quotes have previously hinted at features in upcoming games, which has led some people to think that there was once more planned to be connected to this book. I don't think that's the case. I think this is just Miyamoto adding meaning to an otherwise meaningless object, making players think there is more hidden in the game, and then making them investigate further. Unused Goop In the game's code, we can find an unused texture for goop. This version of the goop is much darker than the final one, and using modern emulators, we can see what this goop looks like in-game. And I kind of like it more than what we got. It does a much better job of contrasting the bright, colourful and happy mood of Sunshine's worlds. Why this is cut is unknown, but likely just due to, you know, design issues. One person's like, hey, I like this one. And then some some higher up is like, no, let's make it brown. And, you know, then that's that's what happens. That's how game development works. Skipping Shine 1 in Bianco Hills. Shine 1 in Bianco Hills tasked Mario with destroying a goop piranha before the bridge to the windmill. Which, you all already know, we, 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 we've gone over this, you're all smart. However, what you might not know is that this is optional. Using some fairly simple movement, you can just jump to the end of the bridge and skip right to the PD Piranha fight, which is already loaded up and ready to go. This doesn't break the game though, and once you return to Bianco Hills, it will show you've completed Star 2 and not 1. I find this really cool because I don't think anyone thought of going to the windmill on their first playthrough. You're too tunnel visioned to go to the first objective. But it's nice that it's still in the game and they're giving you these options to go off the path and make your own adventure, even though Sunshine as a whole is much more linear than 64 for example. The Shining Reference In episode 1 of Serena Beach, you are tasked to fight a boss, the Phantom Manta. This boss is infamous for being the most annoying, broken enemy in the game. The way he splits off into smaller, smaller mantas, the electrifying goop, and just the speed of these mantas makes for a fight that is just tedious and annoying. But even still, many games use the same mechanic. Minecraft, Paper Mario, even Centipede. Nintendo wasn't inspired by any of those games in making Phantom Manta, however. They were inspired by something else. This small, pretty much unknown horror book, uh, The Shining, I think it's called? Anyways. In that book, there's a line that reads, A ghostly manta shape floating away over the hotel. It was paper thin like a shadow, and then broke off into smaller forms before turning into smoke and drifting away. This line perfectly describes the Phantom Manta, but there's even more. You fight the Phantom Manta on the stage Hotel Delfino, which contains a hotel filled with ghosts. And where does The Shining take place? A hotel possibly haunted. Coincidence? I think not! Phantom Manta's True Dimension Carrying on from last entry, we have another entry about Phantom Manta. Phantom Manta is just a shadow, but a shadow of what? There are no flying manta rays soaring above Hotel Delfino, but even if there was, why would it hurt Mario? Well, what if it wasn't a shadow at all? What if instead, he's a creature with more than three dimensions? A four-dimensional being? Now, four dimensions isn't easy to explain, but I'm gonna try explain it. So, we'll start simple, right? You got, you got two dimensions. 
you know, you got 2D flat shapes, they have no depth, they just got, they just, they just, they're flat. And then you got 3D, and now that we're 3D, we have depth, and you know, you can, you can pick us up and throw us across the room. Okay, so then when you go to the fourth dimension, that's when stuff starts to get funky. So if you look at the other two, you, whenever you go up a dimension, you add another line at the vertices of the last two. But with three dimensions, that's a little, that's a little more difficult because you kind of use them all up. But you can do it, and you do it like this. This is a 4D cube. Sorry, no, this is the shadow of a 4D cube. And you see, it's doing the same thing as everything else. It's connecting at the vertices, but it's also... Yeah, it does that. And this is all well and good, but how does this prove that Phantom Manta is a 4D being? Well, if we look at a simulation for what a four-dimensional object would look like in three dimensions, we get this. Starts to make sense now, right? So, we're not actually seeing the full four-dimensional shape. We are seeing a tiny sliver of it, just like if we were 2D beings. If you imagine us as 2D beings, flat, if we were to see a 3D thing, we'd only see a tiny section of it because we can only see in 2D. So, being 3D, we can only see a small 3D part of a 4D object. So maybe the Phantom Manta Shadow is just a tiny snippet of it. Hence why it can interact with Mario, but he can also be a shadow at the same time. Train Station. In the game's files, we can find some leftover text from what appears to be a train system. This was likely going to be used in place of the paint splatters in the final game. And ever since I heard about this, I can't stop thinking about it. I just, I love the idea of a train bringing you from place to place. Like, maybe it starts off as a normal train, but over time it changes depending on where you're going. Like, you have to ride a cable car to Corona Mountain, or you have to switch to a ferry to get to Peanut Park. And as you were traveling, you get this padding shot, like an odyssey, like, God! Boom! Would that have been cool? But anyways, in the game's files, we can find two bundles of text related to the train system. Stops names, and general dialogue options. The dialogue options are just the generic stuff, like, now departing for, or thank you for traveling with us. However, there is something interesting hidden inside here. The mention of Sol coins, or Soul coins? Judging by the text, they were going to be used to buy a ticket to get to different areas. We wouldn't know about Soul Coins if it weren't for the Space World trailer. In this, we can see a counter on the bottom left of what appears to be Soul Coins. These seem to be collected all over the map and were probably replaced by just regular coins in the final game. The stops on the railway lines are as follows. Keep in mind that these are translated from Japanese, so they're kind of rough, but come on, you're smart, you can figure it out. We have Dolphic Town Station, Rico Harbor Station, Bianco Hills, Mama Beach, Serena Beach, in front of Hotel Delfino, Pina Parco, in front of Hotel La Crema, Mare Village, Monte Village, Erto Rock, in front of the Flame Temple, Lighthouse Island, Corona Mountain Entrance, and finally, Battleship Island. A lot of these we can guess or just straight up are in the final game. Dolphic Town probably refers to the town we saw in the Space World Trader, but also was probably transformed into Delfino Plaza. Bianca Hills and Pina Park are just straight up in the game, and Mare Village is just a Japanese version of Noki Village. But there are some that don't appear in the game at all, and this leads directly into the next entry. Battleship Island. So yeah, a lot of the stops mentioned for the train are locations that disappeared on the final release. So let's go through them and see what we can decipher. Let's start with Battleship Island. From the name, it sounds like it might have something to do with an industrial setting, so hear me out. This could have been an early Rico Harbor. Crazy, I know. The problem though is that Rico Harbor is already in the train stop list. So I have two explanations for this. Either Rico Harbor used to be a completely different stage, or Battleship Island, which is another boat harbor type level. Or maybe it was a completely unique theme, the same way that Jolly Roger Bay and Dire Dire Docks are both water stages, but feel different. Then we have Hotel La Crema. This can't be Hotel Delfino because it's already on the list, so maybe it's the same situation as Battleship Island? Okay, maybe this isn't a coincidence. Maybe these island names are just early versions of the final product. Maybe these names were used before they decided on Rico Harbor and Hotel Delfino, but by the time they added in these new names, the train system got scrapped, so then we're left with these duplicate names.
Hotel Delfino Unsettling Aura. Hotel Delfino is the sixth area in Sunshine and features a giant hotel. The stage always takes place in the evening and unlike other negative auras in games, I actually feel this one. The way it's so quiet and setting sun lights up this hidden alcove of the island always makes me feel funky. And the music as well doesn't help. It adds this feeling of discomfort. It's fast yet slow. It's messy and cluttered. It's unorganized and stressed. Not the type of feeling you should be having on a tropical island vacation. Prequel to Luigi's Mansion. Luigi's Mansion and Mario Sunshine released on the same system and share many similarities. One of the most obvious is EGAD. We'll talk more about EGAD later, but for now, all we need to know is that in Sunshine, he is responsible for Flood and the Paintbrush, and in Luigi's Mansion, the Poltergeist 3000. Another similarity is King Boo, who appears as a boss in both games. So how do they connect? Well, it could be either way. Maybe King Boo wanted revenge after Luigi defeated him and saved Mario from the painting in Luigi's Mansion. Or maybe he kidnapped Mario after Sunshine as revenge for defeating him in the casino in Sunshine. Hmm. Thinking about it, maybe it's a Legend of Zelda situation, where the timeline splits off. Maybe if Mario loses to King Boo in Sunshine, he gets captured and the events of Luigi's Mansion play out. Whereas if Mario defeats King Boo in Sunshine, Luigi's Mansion never happens. Looking at some fan timelines, it seems most put Luigi's Mansion first and then Sunshine. Test 11. Test maps are always fun. You got placeholder textures, funky geometry, random items scattered across the ground, and this one is no different. Test 11 only appears in the US and EU version of Sunshine, however, and can only be accessed via cheating. Interestingly, the name Test 11 suggests there are, at the very least, 10 other test maps. Well, there is. According to the stagearc.bin file, there are a total of 20 test maps, divided into two types. Scale maps, named Scale 0 through 9, and test maps named test 10 through 19. These maps were all removed in the Japanese version, but the localization team added back in test 11 into the game. For what reason, I don't know. Okay, now things start to get a bit more outlandish, and so to help me through it, I decided to call in some help. So, without further ado, Sunflower, take it away. Hey, thanks for having me on. And with that being said, let's start off with Sandbird is the Island Deity. The Sandbird appears in Episode 4 of Gelato Beach. You have to slide down the hill from the amphitheater and bounce into the tower. You are then transported to a dreamlike sky area on top of a mythical bird made of sand. But what is this thing? It flies peacefully above the skies of Isle Delfino. As the theory states, maybe it's a deity of the island, but this raises some questions. Did it hatch from the egg? If so, where did the egg come from? Is there more sandbirds like it? Are sandbirds just a regular part of the Mushroom Kingdom? Or was this a deity that lay dormant for years? EGAD helped both Mario and Bowser. As previously stated, EGAD created the Flood and the Paintbrush, so he helped the good guy, but also the bad guy. What's up with that? Is EGAD actually just selling his weapons to the highest bidder? The game never disproves this answer. I mean, Bowser Jr. just straight up says that he was given it by EGAD and not stolen. This is my magic brush. When I draw with this, all my wishes come true. The strange old man and the white coat gave it to me. I guess EGAD is really just a greasy businessman after all. Magic Paintbrush uses stem cells. Stem cells are cells with the unique ability to develop into specialized cell types in the body. So I guess this theory suggests that the goop the paintbrush produces is made of stem cells. It could be, but I think this just reinforces the question of, how does this paintbrush work? Flood is just a water jetpack. The Poltergeist 3000 is just a vacuum. But the paintbrush can create a sticky matter-like substance easily, and along with that, this substance can create life within it. Pinner Park Safety Violations No Sherlock, I mean, look at this place. Electrified turtles, ferris wheels spinning towards the speed of light, giant mechs with rockets, how the f*** did this get planning permission? What person looked at the blueprints for this and was like, yeah, okay, that checks out, like, no, it doesn't, what is this, who did this, why is it like that, that is so dangerous, this is gonna kill so many people, you have a lawsuit on your hands, what are you doing? 
Uh, anyway, moving on from this monstrosity, Noki Bay Underwater Ruins. In the fourth mission on Noki Bay, you are sent under a waterfall to help an eel with teeth issues. This seems innocent enough until you actually get there. The eel inhabits this giant underwater arena type area. Giant pillars holding the roof up, tiny windows and doors line the walls, but the only thing left living here is the giant eel. This place is so detailed and brings up the question of, what happened here? Was this place once lived in by people but has since been abandoned? Maybe because of some horrific event or attack? What makes this worse is the render distance. It makes it so you can never see everything. And who knows what's hiding in the dark. Anyway, that's been me. Thanks for having me on, Big Marsh. I'll hand it back to you. Thanks again, Sunflower. But let's keep the momentum going with Rico Harbor Reset Glitch. In Rico Harbor, you can hop onto one of these squids and surf your way over to the tunnel. Then, just before you enter, pause the game and select Exit. The game will resume, Mario will enter the tunnel, and then, instead of just exiting the level, the game fully resets. This glitch is weird and seems like something that might be useful in speedruns, but nope. There's no need in a speedrun to ever go to Rico Harbor, and then there's even less use to restart all the way to the title screen. Nevertheless, it's a cool glitch. Pianta Pikmin Evolutionary Link Pianta are the island inhabitants of Delfino Island, and Pikmin are small creatures from the Pikmin series. The odd plant-like stalk erupting from both their heads could be a hint towards some sort of deeper connection. While probably only a coincidence, I do like how the Pikmin have a leaf, whereas the Pianta, who are much bigger, have fully grown trees. Now, whether this was an intentional design decision or just a crazy coincidence, well, we may never know. But it's cool to think about nevertheless. Pianta Village Pocket Dimension Pianta Village is one of the weirder stages in Sunshine. Unlike other stages that you can easily place on the island, this one is a little harder. And then there's the issue of the black void the village seems to be suspended over. Could this mean Pianta Village is its own pocket dimension? Well, not quite. Strangely, it is actually connected to the island. Like this? Don't question it. Something doesn't quite add up, however. These mushroom-like trees are not seen anywhere else on Delfino Island. There's also these chain chomps that also don't appear anywhere else in the game. Evidence like this might point towards the fact that Pianta Village is in its own pocket dimension, its own separate universe to the rest of the island. Time Anomalies I'm not entirely sure on this one, but I think it has something to do with the way certain levels will have certain times that will always be the same, regardless of when you enter them. For example, Serena Beach is always in the evening, and Pianta Village is at night the first time you enter it. This is strange, as Delfino Plaza is always in the daytime. In my mind, this points towards two things. Either there's some sort of weird time shenanigans happening every time Mario enters a paint splatter. Maybe although it looks instant, the travel between these places takes a lot of time. So to Mario, it's just hopping through from one place to another, but for everyone else on the island, maybe it takes hours or even days for him to pop back through. This just raises more questions as to what these paint splatters really are and how they work, which I'm not going to get into. Or the other option, which is, maybe there was some sort of day-night cycle plan for Sunshine that never got implemented. Maybe the original idea was to have a world that changes time and sticks throughout the levels, but due to time constraints or just a lack of needing it, they got cut. So what we see in the finished game is just remnants of a forgotten feature. Lava Cheep Cheep Lava Cheep Cheeps, also known as Toby Lava Fish, are enemies found in Sunshine. They are variants of the Cheep Cheep and swim in lava. These fish are much different from regular Cheep Cheeps, however. They are dark purple in colour and only swim one direction. Along with this, their pupils are shaped like stars, which according to most cartoons, could suggest they are dead, meaning they aren't swimming in the lava but merely getting washed along with the flow of it. This is supported by the fact that they never want to attack Mario directly, so are they just corpses floating through pools of lava? If so, how did they get there? There's no water near the lava in Corona Mountain, so did someone put them here? Also, hello, quick side note, this is uh, coming from the editing room. While trying to find an image of the Lava Cheep Cheep, I stumbled upon this post from Tumblr user The Great Greninja. He points out a striking resemblance between Lava Cheep Cheeps 
and these little skeleton guys in Odyssey. Now, what you'll notice about the guys in Odyssey, however, is that their heads are a skull, which reinforces the theory that Lava Cheep Cheeps are dead. Mario's hat is a life support machine. I never knew this, but when a swiping stew steals Mario's hat, his health slowly drains. Why is this? Well, according to the wiki, it is because it's so hot in Isle Delfino. But that doesn't make much sense. I mean, if the only thing stopping Mario from dropping dead is his hat, he shouldn't even be in Isle Delfino in the first place. Early Bianco Hills Pollution Map Some try and use pollution maps to map out where graffiti or pollution should be on a level. While these are mostly normal, and just simply map out where the goop should be, hidden in the game's files are some leftover maps. Most just containing some doodles from the developers or cut maps that were replaced, but there is one creepier one. Early Bianco Hills. In this weird drawing, we see a creature with sunken eyes and a strange smile, appearing next to a Goomba and Piranha plant. This seems very out of place. The other enemies make sense in terms of Bianco Hills, but this creature makes no appearance or is referring to anything. So that begs the question, what is it? Ely Mouth Boss Full Form Scrapped Ely fills the role of Noki Bay's boss battle. This fight involves cleaning Ely's teeth without getting eaten, inside this giant abandoned stadium that we discussed earlier. Ely is a dark black and purple eel with two sets of what appear to be glowing yellow eyes. He resides at the very bottom of the stadium with only his head popping above the ground. His colour, along with the colour of the stage and the GameCube fog, makes this fight one of the creepiest in the game and his appearance brings up some questions. How big is Ely? Why does he have two sets of eyes? And why is he the only thing living down here? And with that, we've reached the bottom of the Super Mario Sunshine Iceberg. I hope you all enjoyed. This video took a lot of time to make, so I'd really appreciate if you subscribed, maybe? Possibly? Thank you so much to Sunflower for appearing in it. If you don't know who he is, he makes great Iceberg videos that if you haven't already seen, go check them out. Even if you have seen them, go watch them again. And uh, keep an eye on his channel, because uh, I might be appearing in a video very soon. Oh. Um, but yeah, huge thanks to him. He did a great job with everything, and he was a joy to work with. Other than that, uh, hope you all have a happy Christmas or just happy holidays in general, and I'll see you all next year. Bye bye